the Concorde, perhaps one of the most well-known aircraft to ever be produced. An instantly recognisable silhouette with its slender data wings, long cylindrical fuselage and famous droop nose. Loved by aviation enthusiasts around the world, it is one of only two commercial supersonic airliners to be produced and no doubt holds a very special place in the history books. Lego, one of the most popular and instantly recognisable toys on the market, the Danish brand has a devoted following around the world. These tiny plastic bricks have entertained many, many of people, old and young, and over the years have released some impressive models. So what happens when you mix the two together? You get the very impressive set number 10318 LEGO Concorde. Now it has not often been that my passion for aviation and LEGO have crossed over. Usually it's my passion for Star Wars and LEGO that combine. So as a mad keen aviation enthusiast and a LEGO collector, when I got wind that there was rumours of a LEGO Concorde coming earlier this year, I was extremely excited. When leaked images appeared, they only made me more and more excited. There are a few friends and family of mine who do not know that LEGO are releasing a Concorde set. And here it is. The set comes with 21 bags and a nice big instruction booklet. The front of the instructions has some nice information explaining the design of the Concorde and sprinkled throughout a little fun facts about the Concorde and the design of the LEGO model. This is something I haven't seen before on a LEGO set. So now it's time to build this model. It is quite a long build and to make things a bit more interesting, let's have a dive into the history books and take a look back at the history behind the Concorde. By the 1950s, commercial aviation was well developed. Airliners would carry ever increasing amount of passengers further distances at cheaper prices. The jet engine had brought forth a new wave of speed increments allowing airliners to fly faster and cut flying times. By the mid-1950s, military aircraft were more than capable of flying faster than the speed of sound. So it is perhaps not surprising then that aircraft manufacturers started dreaming of designing an airliner that could fly faster than the sand barrier. In the UK, during November 1956, a committee had been set up to investigate the feasibility of a supersonic transport and Bristol and Hawker Siddeley Aviation had commenced designing such an aircraft. Elsewhere in France, Germany and the United States, development work around producing a supersonic transport also began to take off and further develop. Sud Aviation was one such company leading the charge in France. In 1960, due to ever-increasing government pressures, the British Aircraft Corporation was formed from the merger of English Electric Aviation Limited, Vickers Armstrong's Aircraft, Hunting Aircraft and the Bristol Aeroplane Company, whose work on a supersonic transport was taken over by BAC. It was becoming clear to the British that the cost of developing such an aircraft would be astronomical and perhaps unreasonable. Hence, they began to reach out to other countries in an attempt to share the costs between each other. The United States declined, as did Germany, Germany citing that their post-war industry was not yet ready to tackle such a project. However, interest did come from the French, and collaboration between the two countries began in the late 1950s. Then, on the 29th of November 1962, a treaty was signed between the British and the French to undertake a joint program to develop a supersonic transport. Under the agreement, production of the Concorde would be split 50-50 between the two countries. There was to be two final assembly lines, one at BAC's Filton Works, producing the even-numbered Concords, while odd-numbered Concords would have come from the final assembly line at St. Martin, Toulouse. Interestingly, the French and the British had differing views on the specification of the design. The French were more interested in a mid-range aircraft, while the British were of the belief that for the design to be of interest to airlines, that it needed to be capable of flying across the Atlantic. These differing philosophies resulted in originally two aircraft being envisioned, although ultimately, the British were correct, with the airlines showing little interest in the mid-range version, and as a result, working came to a halt on this variant. In 1963, then French President Charles de Gaulle announced the name of the aircraft to the world. Concorde, a word meaning harmony in both English and French. Interestingly, the English version is spelt without the E on the end and was originally used by the British, although ultimately the French version with the E on the end would become the official spelling. 
There were many challenges associated with designing this new type of airliner, let alone other factors such as economic and political issues that the teams had to overcome. For example, shortly after taking office in late 1964, Harold Wilson's Labor government attempted to withdraw from the treaty, citing the skyrocketing costs. The French responded by withdrawing all diplomatic communications with Britain, and in the end, the British were forced to back down and power on. In 1965, the design was frozen, and the building of the prototype began. After much work and challenges, on the 2nd of March, 1969, Concorde 001, assembled at Toulouse, thundered down the runway and into the French skies, marking a major milestone for the project. The first flight of a Concorde. This was quickly followed a month later by the first flight of a British built Concorde, Concorde 002. In June of that year, the Concorde was debuted to the public at the Paris Air Show. Still though, there was much work to be done before the Concorde entered service and there were still many critics of the Concorde, something that would never cease throughout its history. The main issues that arose were the costs of the project, along with environmental issues around the sonic boom and the smoke from the engines. You see, during flights of the first prototypes, the engines bellowed smoke on takeoff. This was fixed though with a redesign of the combustion chambers of the Olympus 593 engines that powered it. The issues around the sonic boom though would never die, and the Concorde was only ever allowed to fly supersonic over water. The Concorde design would undergo a rigorous testing period, with it being subjected to over 5,000 hours of testing, and on its 45th flight, it broke the sand barrier for the first time. In all, four prototypes and pre-production aircraft were built, and it is the most tested aircraft in history. At the end of 1975, the Concorde finally received a certificate of airworthiness. There was interest from the airlines, however the project was dealt a blow when in early 1973, both Pan America and TWA, two of the world's biggest airlines, dropped their options for the Concorde. By July of the following year, it had been decided that only 16 Concords would be produced, and ultimately, they would only ever be used by the national airlines of the British and the French. British Airways and Air France respectively, who were able to buy the Concords at very little cost. The first commercial flights of the Concorde began in January 1976, with British Airways first flight being from London to Bahrain, while Air France was from Paris to Rio de Janeiro via Dakar. Initial flights to the United States were banned after the US Senate had ruled in 1970 that commercial supersonic flights were banned over mainland USA due to environmental concerns. This wouldn't be overturned by the Supreme Court until 1976 on the basis that Air Force One produced more noise during takeoff and landing than the Concorde. This allowed British Airways and Air France to begin services to Washington but flights to New York would have to wait until the end of 1977 as a local band of supersonic aircraft still existed around New York. The Concorde was fast, cruising at 1,350 miles per hour, twice the speed of sound, at between 50,000 to 60,000 feet, the crossing of the Atlantic would only take about 3.5 hours, compared to the 8 hours it would take on a normal airliner. The fastest ever crossing of the Atlantic occurred on February 7, 1996, with it completing the crossing in 2 hours and 52 minutes. But it wasn't cheap, with a RAND ticket costing on average about $12,000. Far outreach for most people, but the Concorde with only 100 seats was marketed for the elite business market, being able to take considerable time off flight journeys and provide great luxury. Costs of operating the Concorde were also not cheap, and as operating and maintenance costs started to increase, the routes the Concorde flew were cut back. Services to Rio, Washington, Miami and Singapore were all victims, and eventually all that remained was the service to New York. This route was also struggling to fill seats. Then disaster struck the program. On the 25th of July 2000, Air France Flight 4590 from Paris to New York operated by the Concorde, was taking off when it ran over a piece of aluminium debris that had fallen from the aircraft taking off before it. The piece of debris punctured a tyre, which then ruptured a fuel tank and two engines were lost. The aircraft would crash, killing all 109 on board, as well as six on the ground. As a result of the accident, Air France granted all their Concords, and British Airways followed suit shortly after. 
The Concorde would return to service in November 2001, however it is often cited that the Concorde image would never recover from the accident. In 2003, with operating and maintenance costs continually increasing, passenger demand declining, Air France, British Airways and Airbus, who by the early 2000s, after several mergers had taken over supporting the Concorde, decided that the time was right to retire the Concorde from service. Air France operated its final scheduled flight on the 30th of May 2003 from New York to Paris. In the months following, four Concords were donated and flown to museums, including one final crossing of the Atlantic to the National Air and Space Museum in Washington. The Concorde would end service with British Airways on the 24th of October 2003, when one last flight was flown from New York to London. This marked the end of the Concorde's career and some nearly 27 years of service. Of the 20 aircraft built, all but two are preserved and on display in either the UK, France, the USA, Barbados and Germany. So I've completed the build and here is the LEGO Concorde. LEGO has nailed it. The Concorde's beautiful, sleek lines have been captured near perfectly and the build was extremely fun and enjoyable. So to begin with, let's look at the model as a whole. LEGO has gone with what I can gather to be a very similar colour scheme to that of the prototype Concorde's. There is one issue though with this livery. Cross-referencing images and even the image on the back of the box, you will notice that the red stripe down the fuselage should stop at the passenger door rather than continue past it to the start of the windshield. A slight inaccuracy, although interestingly, British Airways liveries did have a blue stripe that went all the way to the beginning of the cockpit windshield. Due to the extreme heat the Concorde airframe would be exposed to while flying, the design team specifically designed a highly reflective white paint that prevented the aircraft from overheating and being able to operate within safe temperatures. The importance of the paint can be seen when in 1996, Air France painted a Concorde in an all blue livery as part of a promotion with Pepsi. This particular aircraft could not exceed Mach 2 for more than 20 minutes due to heating concerns, while the wings remain white due to fuel heat concerns. Now let's take a closer look starting with the front of the aircraft. Here we have the pointed nose and cockpit windshield. The cockpit windshield pieces are new elements printed which is a nice finish. In fact, there are no stickers in this set, which is a very welcome addition. Importantly, LEGO have been able to embed the Droop Nose system, one of the most iconic features on the Concorde. The Droop Nose was incorporated into the Concorde design because when landing and taking off, it was necessary to have an extremely high angle of attack. With the normal nose, during these phases of flight, the pilots had very limited visibility. The normal nose was needed though when in supersonic flight to minimise drag. The droop nose gave the best of both worlds, allowing for the nose to drop out of the way and thus give the pilots much improved visibility when landing and taking off, while placing the nose in the best aerodynamic position when cruising. On the LEGO model, you simply just push it down to activate takeoff slash landing mode and then up to activate cruise position, a nice function that was essential for LEGO to have gotten right. Moving slightly back from the windshield, we can see this little piece sticking out. And this is what I really love about this model, are these small intricate details that most LEGO fans will most likely miss, but aviation enthusiasts will rejoice in. This small strip here are actually on the Concorde and are known as strakes, helping to improve airflow over the wings. Past that we have the main passenger door and underneath a nice printed piece to represent the static ports for the flight instruments. Looking down the side of the fuselage are printed windows. Now we come to the large, slender Delta wings, which I think LEGO have knocked out the park. They look extremely good and they are quite an intricate build. It is said that during the design phase of the Concorde, the engineers spent the most time designing the wings of the Concorde. It was a critical element, particularly for it to handle well at lower subsonic speeds. What was decided on was a slender Ogavale wing, a wing that could produce sufficient lift at lower speeds, but also minimize drag when at supersonic speeds. Moving to the back of the wing, LEGO has implemented six working alevons, three on each wing. 
This is true to the design of the Concorde, as instead of having a traditional aileron and elevator, it had these six alevons that can control the roll and the pitch of the aircraft. Underneath the wings are the four Olympus 593 power plants, two under each wing, that powered the Concorde. Very slender and LEGO have integrated them very well into the design. Another unique feature of the Concorde is that it is the only commercial airliner to utilise reheat technology, which was critical to generate the extra thrust needed for takeoff and then a transition to supersonic flight. Next up is the tail, which I love the blue and white colour scheme, and not to mention the brick with Concorde printed on it. The rudder can be moved left and right and is correctly broken into two pieces. During the lifetime of the Concorde, there were a few troubles with the rudder. It had first occurred in 1989 when a British Airways Concorde was flying from Christchurch to Sydney when a section of the rudder broke off. Then in 1992, following a string of rudder failures, including one in March that year that saw part of the upper rudder disappear while en route to JFK Airport from London, British Airways made the decision to replace both sections of the rudder on all seven of its machines. Still, in November 2002, there was another incident over the Atlantic of part of a rudder falling off. In all, British Airways had five rudder failures, while Air France had one during February 2003, just before the type was retired. In all cases though, the plane was successfully able to land safely. Now we are at the back of the model. Here we have the little tailwheel. When the Concorde took off and landed, the angle of attack was so steep that there was the potential to strike the back of the aircraft, and hence the wheel was added at the back to add protection if that occurred. The back of the aircraft is also where we have a very nice play feature built into the model. If we spin the cone like so, the undercarriage will deploy, and if we twist back the other way, it retracts. A very nice feature, and the system behind it is quite intricately built into the model. Perhaps this is my favourite feature on the model and I think the Concorde looks great with the undercarriage down or with it up. The final part of the model is the interior spacing. By lifting up these two panels here, we can get a small model of part of the interior. The Concorde could fit 100 people, and according to LEGO, they have modelled this section off the interior of one of the aircraft designs from the 1970s. To top the model off, LEGO have also included this stand, which makes for displaying the Concorde much easier. It also fits the build well and adds to the elegant style of the set. The stand has a printed element which states some basic stats on the Concorde. A nice touch. Now you may have noticed on the plaque and on the box that it says Airbus, and you may well say Airbus didn't make the Concorde. It was the British Aircraft Corporation and Sud Aviation. Sud Aviation would later become Aerospatiale during a merger with Nord Aviation in 1970. This has been something I've also seen come up on the internet with a few people angry that the Airbus logo is there. Part of that though is because Aerospatiale would eventually after a couple of mergers come to be part of Airbus and as a result Airbus held the certificate of airworthiness for the plane. Airbus took over the maintenance and continued support of Concorde from the early 2000s to its retirement in 2003. So while it was not the designer of the aircraft, in many ways it was gifted the design. No doubt as well, LEGO would have been needed permission to release the set and that is hard to get from a company that no longer exists. Overall, this LEGO model is beautiful and something I would recommend to any aviation enthusiast. It's big, coming in just over a metre long, but man does it display well. It's sleek, it's elegant, it captures the lines of the Concorde perfectly. The built-in features are great additions, and the building process is one of the best I have undertaken. In Australia, it retails for $300, which with 2,083 pieces and no stickers is quite honestly a steal, especially considering how pricey some LEGO models have become. LEGO have been releasing car models now for the last few years, and I hope the Concorde is the start of something similar with aircraft. I would love to see a 747, or a 380, or even a Constellation or DC-3 done. And I would love a Spitfire, but LEGO have made it clear they won't do anything war related, and thus there is very little chance we will ever see a Spitfire. The legacy of Concorde is something that is still highly debatable. Was it a great success? pushing the boundaries of commercial aviation and a symbol of cooperation between two nations, or was it a waste of money on an overly ambitious project that had no real benefit?
While the Concorde may be one of two commercial aircraft to fly supersonically, in recent years there has been renewed interest in this idea. With a handful of new concepts popping up and airlines, most notably United, having invested in these new designs. Perhaps then, the return of supersonic transports are not that unrealistic. Thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you do, make sure to go leave a like and subscribe for future videos. In the meantime, keep flying high.